Uh, tonight, today I want to speak to you on the subject of Babylon's final fall. Babylon's final fall. And if you have outline in your bulletin, uh, you can follow along with us. Number one, there will be no record of her. There will be no record of her. Number two, there will be no rejoicing over her. No rejoicing over her. And number three, there will be no rebuilding her. No rebuilding her. And we do have four points today. There will be no redemption for her. And we will be looking at these four points. You know, a true saying about Christians and lost people is this. We become like what we worship. Think about that. Lost and saved, we become what we worship. True worship makes us more like God. We will love what he loves and hate what he hates. God hates sin and evil, and so should we. But God also loves the sinner and wants everyone to know Jesus Christ. And it says that in his word. The fact is that every person on earth has to decide who they are going to worship and where they want to spend in eternity. And again, there are only two choices, folks, in the holy word of God. You are either going to heaven or you are going to hell. And again, it does not do my heart any good to know that there are people going to hell. But God has showed himself even if they didn't have the Bible. Uh, you know, Psalms tells us that heavens declare the glory of God. So we are all accountable by ourselves. It's not a family decision. It's not a couple's decision. We decide where we are going according to God's holy word. In our text today, John sees another vision of Babylon being utterly destroyed. The prayers of Revelation 6 martyrs are being answered. God's vengeance will fall on Babylon for the last time. This will be the conclusion of the judgment seen in the book of Revelation. These people allowed false religion of the Antichrist to replace the Bible's true relationship with God and Jesus and true righteousness. Folks, it doesn't matter what man says. What matters is what God says. And we are following God's word in Revelation line by line. So let's look at, number one, there will be no record of her. her. Revelation 18, 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. Thus with violence, the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. We have seen this is the third angel in this chapter, the mighty angel. And we know that angels are messengers of God. And each angel has a specific purpose God used. And we have to see that uh, he, the angel was in heaven and he took up a stone, not just a stone, a great millstone. And we know from uh, history and we know from Bible history that a millstone was what was used to ground grain. And, you know, a lot of times uh, the larger ones were used in larger capacities and they would have a donkey that would go around and that millstone would go around and, and crush that grain. And it says, and, it, and threw it into the sea. Well, why would he do that? Well, there's two reasons, I believe, that are symbolic here. The first one is, uh, you know, the, the crushing of the grain. I am telling you, God, in, in, uh, in things that we have read already, the grape, the wine press and the grapes, okay? God crushes, uh, you know, his enemies just as they crush the grapes and, and the grain. So we see that symbolic of this is the finality of those judgments, but also when you see the stone and you hear it, I don't know if you've ever done this, and I have. Matter of fact, one time, there was a time in my young life where I thought I knew everything. Y'all been there? You know, 17, 18 years old. And me and a couple of my buddies, we were hiking out at the Wichita Refuge there in Lawton, and we were throwing rocks into this, this creek, this creek and, and there was a place that looked almost like a swimming hole there. And a hiker came up to, to us and said, do you realize that if you throw, if everyone that came by here threw a stone in here, the water wouldn't be there? 
And I thought about that. And, you know, I've never done that again because I just thought, you know, that guy made sense. But even at that, all right, when you think of throwing a stone, there's a difference between skipping a rock on top of the water and throwing a large rock. You can almost hear it when it hits the water. I've done it before. And the other thing is, if you throw it into a sea, that will not be seen anymore. Especially in biblical times, they, they had no way of going down, you know, and, and getting, those on the, getting those off the bottom of a lake. So that is the analogy here of what is happening to Babylon. I mean, the, God destroys it, that, that, that just almost like a bomb goes off when, when you throw a huge boulder into water. And then to try to retrieve that, I'm not saying you can't. I'm simply saying in those days, it was harder to do. So this is, this is symbolic of what he's saying. And then the second part says, with violence, the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down. And folks, it's the old adage of what you know goes around, comes around. That's the, the worldly word for it. But we reap what we sow, folks. If we reap sin, we are going to reap sin in our life. If we, and, and, you know, if we do goodness, if we do righteousness, we will reap righteousness. And so through this whole book of Revelation, you can see that the, the world has just turned against God. The Antichrist has taken over in power, and they have uh, slaughtered literally millions of Christians and set themselves up where they lived richly, and, and the Antichrist was worshipped. And God said, enough's enough. Let me tell you something, folks. God draws lines in sand. He does. I'm going to share that with you at the end of this service. There's a line that was drawn, and when we cross that line, we will see the wrath of God in our lives. So it says, we will be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. Matter of fact, prophetically, Jeremiah, hold your finger there and go to Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah 51. And I want you to see this starting in verse 54. Jeremiah 51, 54. And the sound of a cry comes from Babylon, the destruction from the land of Chaldeans, because the Lord is plundering Babylon and silencing her loud voice. Though her waves roar like great waters and the noise of their voice is being uttered, because the plunder comes against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men are taken, every one of their bows is broken. Folks, I am telling you, there is no power on earth greater than the power of God. There is no army on earth that can defeat God's army. And then the rest of that verse, for the Lord uh, is the God of recompense, he will surely repay. Oh, folks, there is coming a judgment day. There is coming a day where everyone is going to stand before God. Everyone lost, saved, every human being is going to stand for, before God and give an account of their life to a mighty, holy God. Now look down in verse 60. Verse 60. So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that would come upon Babylon. All these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Syriac, when you arrive in Babylon and see it and read all these words, then you shall say, O oh Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off so that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. Because you're talking about the end of civilization on earth as we know it. And it says, now it shall be when you have finished reading this book that you shall tie a stone onto it and throw it out into the Euphrates. Then you shall say, thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophic uh, that will bring, up, from, bring upon her. And they shall be weary. These are the words of Jeremiah. So we can see how God, even in the Old Testament, was warning Israel and was warning folks and, and God's enemies. 
And that is a parallel to this chapter and all through the book of Revelations. I've tried to give you uh, the prophetic looks of what God has done and what he is going to do. So we see there will be no record of her. He will wipe it off the face of the, the, the map. Number two, there will be no rejoicing over her. Look at verse 22. And the sound of harpist, musicians, flutists, and trumpets shall not be heard in you anymore. What are all these things? Uh, Steve, these are instruments of praise. We, I don't know about you, but I listen to Christian music all the time. If I'm in my truck, I listen to Christian music. All right, when I'm not reading, I'm listening to Christian music. All right, it's just always in my head. And folks, you can grow in the Lord. We need to put positive things in our lives. If we put trash in our lives, trash is going to come out. And so here he is saying those things that were important, those things that gave you joy, those things. Uh, let me do a commercial here for you, Steve. Next Sunday night, next Sunday night right here, we are going to have a hymns of praise we're going to have a whole bunch of folks in here and a whole bunch of folks up there. I hope you'll come back. Why? Because it lifts your spirits. It speaks to your soul. It feeds your inner being. And it permeates not only your mind, but your heart. So he's saying that these things will not take place. When this happens, when it is destroyed, it will be silence. And I don't know about you, but most people, silence drives them crazy, all right? I don't understand the folks that can be doing homework, and they got headphones on, and they got the TV on, and they got all this going on. One of the deals when I, when I was thought, thinking about, you know, our sanctuary here and what I needed to do, I used to be, my office was in the main office, and, you know, I'd hear the phone rings. Oh, Steve would be over there singing and playing music, you know, and Chuck's in the back there, you know, doing things, and all this was going on. But I, I, my office, by the way, if nobody knows where my office is, it's right out that door right there, okay? All right? But check in at the main office first, okay? And here's what I'm saying. When I'm over there, I can totally focus on the Word of God. I can totally focus on scripture texts. I can, the silence there is so that I can hear God speak to me. Because folks, I take it an honor. I, I count it an honor for God to use me in this place. It is an honor to hear from God and say, thus saith the Lord. You don't need a Christian psychology lesson. You need preaching from the word of God. We need folks that are filled with the Spirit and love God and love His Word and love people, all right? It's not about how big we get or how much money we have or how many is in our sanctuary. It's about God. And I'm telling you, these things will not be here. Look what it says, no craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. All right, people, in, in last week, you know, the three things that we talked about uh, last week, the kings uh, will not be there anymore. The merchants will not be there anymore. The ship, shipping will not be there anymore. And all of these things will be gone. And it says, and shall not be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. And there they're talking about the smaller stones where individuals uh, crush the grain uh, so that they can make, make bread and things like that. So none of this will be there. There will be total silence. Matter of fact, you know, the, the hardest thing, I, I, me and my dad, we didn't see exactly eye to eye. And uh, normally what he did was he looked around. I, I thank God when he had a belt on. I just think, thank you, Jesus. All right? Because if he didn't have one, he was looking around somewhere. And I remember one time when I got in what I call big trouble, one of the dumbest things I've ever done. And he come into my room, and he simply said, Mike, I'm ashamed of you. I am totally ashamed 
and turned and walked out. Man, you talk about, it was like a brick was on me. It was like a stone was on me. And do you realize, I'll tell you how, what effect it had. I had never did that again in my life. Never again. Folks, silence says something. Do you realize that sometimes God is silent? Read the Bible, folks. Read the Word. It's not that He's not talking to you. It's that you're not listening to Him. And He's got to get you quiet. Folks, we're so busy. We have so many functions and phones and computers and all kinds of things on our head that, that keeps us from zeroing in on God. So everything will be silent. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13. Look at Isaiah 13. The Bible tells us Isaiah 13 verse 19. In Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldean pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian uh, pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there, but wild beasts of the desert will lie there. We're talking desolate. We're talking houses that are empty. We're talking about, uh, you know, where no people are there at all, and their houses will be full of owls, and ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. The hyenas will howl in their citadels, and the jackals in their pleasant palaces. Her time is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. And God through a vision to John and, you know, delivered by this angel saying, I am telling you, Babylon will be destroyed. So we see here, there will be no record of her. There will be no rejoicing over her. And three, there will be no rebuilding her. Look at verse 23. And the light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard any more. For your merchants were great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. There are three examples here that God wanted them to understand and for John to understand that they, and that we need to understand. The light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And folks, light back in those days... All right, they didn't flip on a switch and have electricity back then. Light was everything. Light to us today. I am talking about sunlight is everything. It's just like lunar eclipse is coming up. All right, and, and again, you know, there's, they're just anticipating hundreds of thousands of people coming to this area. All right, and, and it's something uh, that we, again, you know, it doesn't happen a lot in history. And we are going to be very close to, to where it is happening. And the point I'm trying to make is, folks, if that sun is not shining, we are in trouble as a nation and as a people. The sunshine, it's like today. When it's sun, sunny out there, you know, it's, it's, it's those Sundays you, you, you get up and, man, it's raining and it's dark and it's wet and it's cold. And here's what I hear. Oh, I just didn't want to get dressed today. Oh, it's just too cold. It's too wet. It's too... But yet, you know, if we have a ball game and they're out there and they're playing football outside or baseball outside, we're out there watching it like that. My point is, folks... The sunshine is so important. I mean, it, it really even helps us physically. And there will be no light. There will be no light. There will be not lamps. We, we saw the, the plagues of darkness that we talked about. And then the second thing is the voice of uh, bridegroom and bride shall not be heard anymore. And folks, uh, weddings are a, it's just a great time in the lives of two families. It's a wonderful time 
man, they just, you know, they're all decked out in white and people come and it's a re- joyous times of all that is going on, but that will not be going on anymore. And it says, and your merchants, the great men of the earth, by your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. Boy, I'm telling you, when I read this, and I've read it before, but that word this time, sorcery, really stuck out in my mind. And let me say this, folks. The devil is having a heyday right now. You turn the TV on, okay? You watch some of the video games that our children and youth are playing. It is no wonder what is going on in our society is going on. And I really believe these games where you kill people desensitizes people, and they even in their own mind, it's like a video game. And you have to understand, sorcery has to deal with evil things, evil powers, demonic powers. And folks, that's the way the Antichrist is going to be. You think of all that he is going to do and, and, and the lives that he, he's going he's to persecute Christians. He's going to uh, murder Christians. And it's evil. And just like Hitler himself and all that he was trying to do, folks, you could associate that with sorcery also. But we are, we are watching it. We are listening to it. And we know it's bad. But folks, it's going to get even worse. We need to have filters on our computers. We need to know what our kids are doing on their phones. We need to understand that sorcery is not a good thing. It is a terrible thing. And then you have to understand, when when it's all said and done, Satan is behind every bit of these things. Folks, you're not safe anywhere anymore. I mean, we truly, I mean, we have security here, and I thank God for our security. But we know shootings. Just a few weeks ago, there was a shooting. Uh, Joel uh, uh, Olsen, yes, at his church. Folks, I'm just telling you, evil is all around us, and God is going to destroy all evil. He gives us an Old Testament example of that. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19. Genesis 19. Well, I'm in Exodus 19. That's not going to (laughs) work. And we know what had happened. Lot uh, had two angels knock on his door, and uh, they came uh, to basically to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And I don't want to go through all that. If we had more time, I'd go through the whole chapter of seeing the things that were going on. But basically, God told him, get your family and get out of there. I am going to destroy this. All right? And these men, these, these homosexuals, and, and by the way, folks, I don't hate homosexual. I hate their sin. Okay? It's wrong. It's an abomination to God. And they are putting it on mainstream TV. I've seen commercials where guys are kissing guys. You see uh, all these, uh, you know, programs where they they weave homosexuality in a lot of these programs. And they want to make it normal. Folks, read uh, Romans chapter 1. Read Romans 1. It clearly says that it is an abomination to God. And these men came up around Lot. They saw these two angels and, and, and were thinking evil thoughts and wanted them to come outside and wanting Lot to give them up. And Lot would not do it. And so, so you know, they gave up. And, and again, read the rest of that. But look in verse 23, verse 23 of Genesis 19. And the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zor, and then... Uh, The Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. God told him, you get out of there and don't look back. Folks, 
We, what we look at matters. There's a billion dollar industry still going on in our world called pornography. And I'm telling you, there are men and women hooked on pornography. And there is nothing good that comes from that. It is sorcery. It is, it is the hook. It's the devil's thing. And folks, it will wreck people's lives. It will wreck marriages. It will wreck relationships. And she looked back and paid the price. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and towards all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Folks, you don't have to go to Las Vegas or New York or some of these big cities to see pornography and to see the wickedness of that sin. It is literally from the depths of hell, and we need to stand against it. There will be no record. There will be no rejoicing. There will be no rebuilding. And the last one, there will be no redemption. No redemption. Look back in our text, the last part here. Let me get on the right page. The last verse 24. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who were slain on the earth. Babylon had killed God's prophets and had killed God's saints. And folks, we shouldn't be surprised that Babylon in the end days would do this. In John's day, think about it. It was the Roman Empire. And everyone thought the Roman Empire was, was you know, you, you couldn't defeat it because of the soldiers and the forts and all the things that there, but yet they were overthrown also. And folks, I am telling you in these days when the Antichrist comes to power, God is going to destroy his kingdom, the Antichrist kingdom. And, and you will see later on, we will, we will a few weeks from now see the battle of Armageddon and all that will be going on there. And when you think about that, even the Romans, you know, one of the, the games they like to play, they, they would play, you know, the gladiator games and they would put Christians out there and they would put it just basically where, you know, that you can't win. Okay. They didn't give them the armor. They might've given them a sword, but they didn't have the chariots and all these things. And then they would even people that uh, would you know, be Christians and so-called go against Rome. They would literally douse them in, in, in oil and they would at night set them on fire and, and they would literally burn to death. Some of these things were happening there. And so you can see during this tribulation time, some of these things will be going on also. And God's vengeance, I am telling you, is going to fall. It's going to fall. Matter of fact, uh, 1 John 5, just turn back a few pages. It's not very far. Not very far. And I want to just briefly speak as we close on there is a sin unto death. Okay, there is a sin unto death. If God has given you one call to salvation, which he promises everyone. If you say no to that call, God doesn't have to call you again. He doesn't. He's given you a chance. But I'm telling you, I thank God that he is a forgiving God. God gave me personally three chances I made, I walked down an aisle when I was five years old. I didn't know what I was doing. I just wanted to be baptized. I thought that was a cool thing. And then when I was 14 years old, I went to Falls Creek and Marty, it's a huge one. I mean, there were, you know, 4,000 people there a week for four straight weeks. And on a Friday night, I heard a song and 
I did hear the scripture and I did go down and I prayed a prayer. But you know, the deal with prayer is I, I really believe my life did not change. Well, I know my life did not change. And I think my m whole motive was, I don't want to go to hell. Well, folks, I don't want to go to hell doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Okay, anybody can say, I love God. Anybody can say, I'm a Christian. Okay, there needs to be fruit to that. And God, according to the Bible, gives everyone a chance to be saved. Everyone. But there is a sin unto death. If anyone sees his brother's sin a sin, which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. Okay, there are sins that we can be forgiven for. The only sin that will cause total separation from God is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, not accepting Christ, saying no to the invitation of Christ. And yes, he does ask more than once to most people. But folks, I am telling you, you are living on dangerous grounds because we got this idea in our head, if I go to church, I'm saved. If I'm baptized, I'm saved. If my daddy was a deacon or my dad was a, or my dad was a preacher or if you know, I give on Sundays, I'm saved. All those are things you, that, that are good. They are good things. But things do not save you. God saves you. Repentance of sin saves you. Committing your life to Jesus Christ saves you and keeps you from that eternal death. But there is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about it, about that. And again, the lost person that denies Christ, that does not accept Christ, I'm just telling you folks, when you die, you are going to hell according to the word. But there's also even Christians, all right? Christians, it's, it's not, I'm not doubting anyone's salvation, but I know folks, uh, and, and I know one, I don't want to say where it happened and what happened, but I truly believe someone uh, that was in one of my Sunday school classes in Lawton got saved, and he had a drinking problem. And I'm telling you, I kept working with him and kept working with him, and he started dating someone outside the faith, and I kept telling him, don't do it. You need to date another Christian. And to make a long story short, one night he and her were out and they had been drinking and he ran a red light. He got T-boned and he was killed. Folks, I, it, it's hard to do funerals like that. It's hard. There is a point where God says, folks, that's exactly what he's doing with Babylon. He's saying, it's enough. It's enough. You won't listen to me, then I will take your life. I will, I will, I will do that. And again, folks, I believe with all my heart, I will, not because I led him to the Lord, but I saw some fruit. I saw, but he just, and folks, alcohol kills people. Alcohol hurts relationships. Alcohol wrecks marriages. And, and we need to understand that there's a time when God says, it, you may not change, you're, if you're not going to change this, you know, there, I, I'm just going to take you out. And so you have to understand the seriousness of God destroying Babylon and the seriousness of us going back sinning. And I'm not saying just because you sin one time. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there is a sin unto death. And then the last example, Mark chapter, and, and this is the one, I understand it, but I don't understand it. Mark chapter 14, verse 16. And the Lord is, Jesus is fixing to do the Lord's Supper. So his disciples went out, verse 16, and came to the city and found it, just as he had said, and said to them, prepare the Passover. In the evening he came with the twelve. Now as they sat and ate, Jesus said, assuredly I say to you, one of you eats with me uh, who eats with me will betray me. And they begin to be sorrowful and say to one another, it is I, is it I, is it I, is it I? And, and it says, he answered and said to them, 
It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. And this is Jesus' words. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to the man whom the Son of Man, Son of man is betrayed. Now this, this sentence is, I mean, I'm just telling you, it is something else. It would have been good for that man if he would have never been born. Gosh, Judas, three years with him, three years with Jesus, saw the miracles, kept the money, pretended that he was a Christian, and yet Jesus looks him square in the face, and it says, it would have been better if you'd never been born. Folks, I am telling you, God's wrath is real. I'm not trying to scare anyone, folks. I'm trying to tell you, if I would have died before my 22nd birthday, I would have spent an eternity in hell as a lost church member. And we need to understand, you can do something about that. God wants you saved. God's given you, for you to be here today, He is giving you another opportunity. And my prayer is, that you would put down. And folks, it's a thing of pride. I was ar- Marty, I was already a youth minister. I already passed the test. But in my heart of hearts, I knew I wasn't. And I had to put down my pride. I had to take off a counselor's badge at a crusade and walk down the aisle and give my life to Jesus Christ for real. And my prayer today is, if there's one person here that doesn't know Christ, Today would be your day of salvation. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you so much for just loving us. God, I thank you for giving us second chances. God, destroying Babylon, destroying this earth, it's coming. It's coming, and I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying today could be a day of salvation. God, I pray that you, your Holy Spirit, would speak to hearts today. God, I pray that if somebody would, needs to be saved, that they would come down and just take us by the hands and say, you know what, I need to be saved today. I've made other decisions before, but I, 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 the Holy Spirit is telling me to get saved this day. And God, I want to speak to the Christian too. God, we do live and look like the world more than we should. And God, I pray that today we would be determined, be determined to live for you the rest of our lives. God, if it's losing friends, if it's losing uh, material things, whatever stands in our way of totally selling out to you, God, I pray we would give that up today. I pray, Lord, some would just come to the altars and pray. God, if there's those that need to be baptized today, I pray that you would speak to them. And God, I pray if there's those that want to join our church, that they would just feel free. God, I pray that time would not be a factor this day. God, all someone's eternity could be weighed on this time that we have. So God, I pray that the Christian would be praying. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would be strong. So God, we give you this invitation. This is your church. This is your time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Will you stand to your feet? Don't hold back. You come.